The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum Recorded by Stage School Australia Chapter 1 The Cyclone Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry and Aunt Em who were farmers. Their house was small for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many miles. Uncle Henry and Aunt Em had a big bed in one corner and Dorothy a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all and no cellar except a small hole dug in the ground called a cyclone cellar where the family could go in case one of the great whirlwinds arose mighty enough to crush any building in its path. It was reached by a trapdoor in the floor from which a ladder led down into the small dark hole. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around she could see nothing but the great grey prairie on every side. Not a tree nor a house broke the broad sweep of country that reached to the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had baked the land into a grey mass. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops off the long blades until they were the same grey colour to be seen everywhere. Once the house had been painted, but the sun blistered the paint and the rains washed it away and now the house was as dull and grey as everything else. When Aunt Em came there to live, she was young and pretty. The sun and wind had changed her too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober grey. They had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were grey also. She was thin and gaunt and never smiled now. When Dorothy, who was an orphan, first came to her, Aunt Em had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand upon her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears. And she still looked at the little girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at. Uncle Henry never laughed. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He was grey also, from his long beard to his rough boots, and he looked stern and solemn and rarely spoke. (coughs) It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh and saved her from growing as grey as her surroundings. Toto was not grey. He was a little black dog with long silky hair and small black eyes that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long. Dorothy played with him and loved him dearly. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even greyer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky. Aunt Em was washing dishes. From the far north, they heard a low wail of the wind and Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. Then now came a sharp whistling in the air from the south and as they turned their eyes that way, they saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction also. Suddenly, Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming, Em. I'll go look after the stock. Then he ran toward the sheds where the cows and horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger close at hand. Quick, Dorothy! Run for the cellar! Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed, and she started to get him. Aunt Em, badly frightened, threw open the trapdoor in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt. When she was halfway across the room, there came a great shriek from the wind and the house shook so hard that she lost her footing and sat down suddenly upon the floor. Then a strange thing happened. The house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood and made it the exact centre of the cyclone. 
The great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it up higher and higher until it was at the very top of the cyclone and there it remained and was carried miles and miles away as easily as you could carry a feather. It was very dark and the wind howled horribly around her but Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. After the first few whirls around, she felt as if she were being rocked gently like a baby in a cradle. Toto did not like it. He ran about the room barking loudly, but Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. Toto got too near the open trap door and fell in, and at first the little girl thought she had lost him. But soon she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole, for the pressure of the air was keeping him up so that he could not fall. She crept to the hole, caught Toto by the ear, and dragged him into the room again, closing the trapdoor so that no more accidents could happen. Hour after hour passed away, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright, but she felt quite lonely and the wind shrieked so loudly all about her that she nearly became deaf. She had wondered if she would be dashed to pieces when the house fell again. But as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. At last, she crawled over the swaying floor to her bed and lay down upon it, and Toto followed and lay down beside her. In spite of the swaying of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy closed her eyes and fell fast asleep. Chapter 2 The Council with the Munchkins Dorothy was awakened by a shock, so sudden and severe that if she had not been lying on the soft bed, she might have been hurt. As it was, the jar made her catch her breath, and Toto put his cold little nose into her face and whined dismally. Dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving, nor was it dark, for the bright sunshine came in at the window, flooding the little room. She sprang from her bed, and with Toto at her heels, ran and opened the door. Dorothy gave a cry of amazement and looked about her, her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sight she saw. The cyclone had set the house down very gently in the midst of a country of marvellous beauty. There were lovely patches of green all about, with stately trees bearing rich and luscious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand, and birds with rare and brilliant plumage sang and fluttered in the trees. A little way off was a small brook, rushing and sparkling along between green banks and murmuring in a voice very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry grey prairies. While she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sights, she noticed coming toward her a group of the oddest people she had ever seen. They were not as big as the grown folk she had always been used to, but neither were they very small. In fact, they seemed about as tall as Dorothy, who was a well-grown child for her age, although they were, so far as looks go, many years older. Three were men and one a woman, and all were oddly dressed. They wore round hats that rose to a small point a foot above their heads, with little bells around the brims that tinkled sweetly as they moved. The hats of the men were blue, the little woman's hat was white, and she wore a white gown that hung in pleats from her shoulders. Over it were sprinkled little stars that glistened in the sun like diamonds. The men were dressed in blue, of the same shade as their hats, and wore well-polished boots with a deep roll of blue at the tops. When these people drew near the house where Dorothy was standing in the doorway, they paused and whispered among themselves, as if afraid to come further. But the little old woman walked up to Dorothy and made a low bow. You are welcome, most noble sorceress, to the land of the Munchkins. We are so grateful to you for having killed the wicked witch of the East and for setting our people free. Dorothy listened to this speech with wonder. 
What could the little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress and saying she had killed the wicked witch of the East? You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did anyway, and that's the same thing. See? There are her two feet still sticking out from underneath. Dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright. There, indeed, just under the corner of the great beam the house rested on, two feet were sticking out, shod in silver shoes with pointed toes. Oh dear! Oh dear! The house must have fallen on her. Whatever shall we do? There is nothing to be done. But who was she? She was the wicked witch of the East. She has held all the munchkins captive for many years, making them slave for her night and day. Now they are all set free and are grateful to you for the favor. Who are the munchkins? They are the people who live in this land of the East, where the wicked witch ruled. Are you a munchkin? No, but I am their friend, although I live in the land of the North. When they saw the witch of the east was dead, the munchkin sent a swift messenger to me, and I came at once. I am the witch of the north. Oh, gracious. Are you a real witch? Yes, indeed. But I am a good witch, and the people love me. I'm not as powerful as the wicked witch was who ruled here, or I should have set the people free myself. But I thought all witches were wicked. Oh no, that is a great mistake. There are only four witches in all the land of Oz, and two of them, those who live in the north and the south, are good witches. Those who dwelt in the east and the west were indeed wicked witches. But now that you have killed one of them, there is but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the west. But Anne Anne has told me that the witches were all dead, years and years ago. Who is Aunt Em? She is my aunt who lives in Kansas, where I came from. The Witch of the North seemed to think for a time, with her head bowed and her eyes upon the ground. I do not know where Kansas is, for I have never heard the country mentioned before. But tell me, is it a civilized country? Oh, yes. Then that accounts for it. In the civilized countries, I believe there are no witches left, no wizards, no sorceresses, no magicians. But you see, the land of Oz has never been civilized, for we are cut off from all the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards amongst us. Who are the wizards? Oz himself is the great wizard. He is more powerful than all the rest of us together. He lives in the city of Emeralds. <gasps> look at that! Oh, look at that! It can't be happening! What is it? They all looked and saw that the feet of the dead witch had disappeared. Nothing was left but the silver shoes. She was so old that she dried up quickly in the sun. That is the end of her. But the silver shoes are yours and you shall have them to wear. She reached down and picked up the shoes and after shaking the dust out of them, handed them to Dorothy. One of the munchkin men stepped forward. The Witch of the East was proud of those silver shoes and there is some charm connected with them. But what it is, we never knew. Dorothy carried the shoes into the house and placed them on the table. Then she came out again. I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle, for I am sure they will worry about me. Can you help me find my way? The munchkins and the witch first looked at one another, and then at Dorothy, then shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, there is a great desert, and none could live to cross it. It is the same at the south, for I have been there and seen it. The south is the country of the quadlings. I am told that it is the same at the west. And that country where the Winkies live is ruled by the Wicked Witch of the West, who would make you her slave if you passed her away. The North is my home, and at its edge is the same great desert that surrounds this land. 
I'm afraid, my dear, you will have to live with us. Oh. <laughs> Dorothy began to sob at this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people. Her tears seemed to grieve the kind-hearted munchkins, who immediately took out their handkerchiefs and began to weep also. <laughs> As for the little old woman, she took off her cap and balanced the point on the end of her nose while she counted in a solemn voice. One, two, three. At once, the cap changed to a slate on which was written in big white chalk marks, let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. The little old woman took the slate from her nose and read the words on it. Is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes. Then you must go to the city of emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where is this city? It is exactly in the center of this country and is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? He's a good wizard. Whether he's a man or not, I cannot tell, for I have never seen him. How can I get there? You must walk. It is a long journey through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me? No, I cannot do that. But I will give you my kiss. And no one will dare injure a person who has been kissed by the Witch of the North. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead. Where her lips touched the girl, they left a round, shining mark, as Dorothy found out soon after. The road to the City of Emeralds is paved with yellow brick, so you cannot miss it. When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. The three munchkins bowed low to her, wished her a pleasant journey and walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times and straightway disappeared, much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she had gone because he had been afraid even to growl while she stood by. But Dorothy, knowing her to be a witch, had expected her to disappear in just that way and was not surprised in the least. Chapter 3 How Dorothy Saved the Scarecrow When Dorothy was left alone, she began to feel hungry, so she went to the cupboard and cut herself some bread. She gave some to Toto, and taking a pail from the shelf, she carried it down to the little brook and filled it with clear, sparkling water. Toto ran over to the trees and began to bark at the birds. Dorothy went to get him and saw such delicious fruit hanging from the branches that she gathered some of it. Then she went back to the house and having helped herself and Toto to a good drink of the cool, clear water, she set about making ready for the journey to the City of Emeralds. Dorothy had only one other dress, but that happened to be clean and was hanging on a peg beside her bed. It was gingham, with checks of white and blue, and although the blue was somewhat faded with many washings, it was still a pretty frock. She washed herself carefully, dressed herself in the clean gingham, and tied her pink sunbonnet on her head. She took a little basket and filled it with bread from the cupboard, laying a white cloth over the top. Then she looked down at her feet and noticed how old and worn her shoes were. They surely will never do for a long journey, Toto. Dorothy saw, lying on the table, the silver shoes that had belonged to the Witch of the East. I wonder if they will fit me. They would be just the thing to take a long walk in, for they could not wear out. She took off her old leather shoes and tried on the silver ones, which fitted her as well as if they had been made for her. Finally, she picked up her basket. Come along, Toto. We will go to the Emerald City and ask the Great Oz how to get back to Kansas again. She closed the door, locked it, and put the key carefully in the pocket of her dress. 
And so, with Toto trotting along behind her, she started on her journey. It did not take her long to find the road paved with yellow bricks. Within a short time, she was walking briskly toward the Emerald City, her silver shoes tinkling merrily on the hard, yellow roadbed. The sun shone bright and the birds sang sweetly and Dorothy did not feel nearly so bad as you might think she would. Dorothy was surprised as she walked along to see how pretty the country was. There were neat fences at the sides of the road, painted a dainty blue colour, and beyond them were fields of grain and vegetables in abundance. Once in a while she would pass a house, and the people came out to look at her and bow low as she went by, for everyone knew she had been the means of destroying the wicked witch and setting them free. The houses of the munchkins were odd-looking dwellings. Each was round, with a big dome for a roof. All were painted blue, for in this country of the east, blue was the favourite colour. Toward evening, when Dorothy was tired with her long walk and began to wonder where she should pass the night, she came to a house rather larger than the rest. On the green lawn before it, many men and women were dancing, while a big table nearby was loaded with delicious fruits and nuts, pies and cakes, and many other good things to eat. The people greeted Dorothy kindly and invited her to supper and to pass the night with them, for this was the home of one of the richest munchkins in the land, and his friends were gathered with him to celebrate their freedom from the wicked witch. Dorothy ate a hearty supper and was waited upon by the rich munchkin himself, whose name was Bok. You must be a great sorceress. Why? Because you wear silver shoes and have killed the wicked witch. Besides, you have white in your frock, and only witches and sorceresses wear white. My dress is blue and white checked. It is kind of you to wear that. Blue is the colour of the munchkins, and white is the witch colour. So we know you are a friendly witch. Dorothy did not know what to say, for all the people seemed to think her a witch, and she knew very well she was only a little girl who had come by the cyclone into a strange land. When she was tired, Bok led her into the house, to a room with a pretty bed in it. The sheets were blue, and Dorothy slept soundly in them till morning, with Toto curled up on the blue rug beside her. She ate a hearty breakfast and watched a wee munchkin baby who played with Toto and pulled his tail and crowed and laughed in a way that greatly amused Dorothy. Toto was a fine curiosity to all the people, for they had never seen a dog before. How far is it to the Emerald City? I do not know, for I have never been there. It is better for people to keep away from Oz unless they have business with him. But it is a long way to the Emerald City, and it will take you many days. The country here is rich and pleasant, but you must pass through rough and dangerous places before you reach the end of your journey. This worried Dorothy a little, but she knew that only the Great Oz could help her get to Kansas again, so she bravely resolved not to turn back. She bade her friends goodbye and again started along the road of yellow brick. When she had gone several miles, she thought she would stop to rest and so climbed to the top of the fence beside the road and sat down. There was a great cornfield beyond the fence and not far away she saw a scarecrow placed high on a pole to keep the birds from the ripe corn. Its head was a small sack stuffed with straw with eyes, nose and mouth painted on it to represent a face. An old pointed blue hat that had belonged to some munchkin was perched on his head and the rest of the figure was a blue suit of clothes, worn and faded, which had also been stuffed with straw. On the feet were some old boots with blue tops, such as every man wore in this country, and the figure was raised above the stalks of corn by means of the poles stuck up its back. 
While Dorothy was looking earnestly into the painted face of the scarecrow, she was surprised to see one of the eyes slowly wink at her. She thought she must have been mistaken, for none of the scarecrows in Kansas ever wink. But presently, the figure nodded its head to her in a friendly way. Good day! Did you speak? Certainly. How do you do? I'm pretty well, thank you. How do you do? I'm not feeling well, for it's very tedious being perched up here night and day to scare away crows. Can't you get down? No, for this pole is stuck up my back. If you'll please take away the pole, I shall be greatly obliged to you. Dorothy reached up both arms and lifted the figure off the pole, for, being stuffed with straw, it was quite light. Thank you very much. I feel like a new man. Who are you? And where are you going? My name is Dorothy, and this is Toto. And I'm going to the Emerald City to ask the Great Oz to send me back to Kansas. Where is the Emerald City? And who is Oz? Why, don't you know? No, indeed. I don't know anything. You see, I'm stuffed, so I have no brains at all. Oh, I am awfully sorry for you. Do you think if I go to the Emerald City with you, that Oz would give me some brains? Who knows? But you may come with me if you like. If Oz won't give you any brains, you'll be no worse off than you are now. That is true. You see, I don't mind my legs and arms and body being stuffed because I cannot get hurt. If anyone treads on my toes or sticks a pin into me, it doesn't matter for I can't feel it. But I don't want people to call me a fool. And if my head stays stuffed with straw instead of with brains, well, how will I ever know anything? I understand how you feel. If you will come with me, I'll ask Oz to do all he can for you. Toto did not like this addition to the party at first. He smelled around the stuffed man as if he suspected there might be a nest of rats in the straw. No, <laughs> don't mind Toto, he never bites. Oh, I'm not afraid. He can't hurt the straw. There's only one thing in the world I am afraid of. What is that? The munchkin farmer who made you? No, it's a lighted match. They walked back to the road. Dorothy helped him over the fence and they started along the path of yellow brick for the Emerald City. The Wizard of Oz by Al Frank Baum. To be continued.